Welcome, welcome, welcome in, welcome in. Thank you for joining me this week in this week's installment of our Bible study. Good evening, beloved. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me this week as we try to wrap up our study concerning Jesus fulfilling the law. As we continue to walk through the earthly ministry of Jesus, the Christ, uh, chronologically, we have landed on the Sermon at the Mount found in Matthew chapter number five, and we have been dealing with Matthew chapter five, verses 17 through 20. Now, we looked at the fact that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. We know that the Pharisees' righteousness is a works-based righteousness that has failed miserably because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We looked at the fact that Jesus has come to fulfill the law. There are no sacrifices that need to be given on his behalf because he is perfect, never made a mistake, never thought sinfully. So he fulfilled the law for righteousness and Romans chapter number 10 verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are made righteous because we put on his righteousness. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's what the scripture says, amen, that we have put on Christ. And uh, I know that we've heard it time and time again. When God sees us, he sees the blood. But even more than that, he sees that we have put on Christ. He covers me from head to toe. Amen. So we began to look at why the law does not work for righteousness and what law is there for us to fulfill. Because Jesus says in verse number 19 of Matthew 5, that if we teach people to break the least of these commandments, then we are the least in the kingdom of heaven. That, that basically that we're rejected. Don't break the commandment. Don't teach others to break the commandment. So what commandments are there for us to keep if Jesus has fulfilled the law? This is something that we've got to understand because so often we misquoted the fact that Jesus comes to fulfill the law and it is misunderstood, misinterpreted, that there's nothing for us to do now that Jesus has done everything. So let us finish this study on uh, Jesus uh, at, uh, imputing righteousness on us. So now today we're going to continue again to finish Verses 17 through 20 of Matthew 5. I'm going to pick up where I left off uh, last week on our explanation of uh, the righteousness as found in Romans chapter number 3. And a verse that we dealt with was verse 21 of Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So this is part three of I just want to be right dealing with our scriptures. Let me read the rest of these scriptures, Romans chapter 3, um, beginning at verse number 22. And he says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Why? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely. By his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood and to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? of works nay but by the law of faith therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law is he the god of the jews only is he not also of the gentiles yes of the gentiles also seeing it is one god which shall justify the circumcision and uncircumcision through faith do we then make void the law through faith god forbid yea we establish the law so Romans chapter number three and the other verses that we dealt with on last week 
in Galatians chapter number three, establish the fact that there is a righteousness that Paul is conveying uh, that came before the law. And this is the righteousness uh, that comes through the model that Abraham set by putting our faith in God. Now, Abraham was made righteous before the law came because he believed God. He believed God for his covenant when he was to leave his home and go where God sent him. He believed God eventually for his covenant that he would give God would give Sarah and Abraham without the handmaiden a seed that they call Isaac. OK, because they laughed about it. He believed God that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now, the Bible says what we're reading is that the righteousness that we attain comes specifically by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, who he himself is righteous, and he makes righteous those who believe in him. OK, and this is not just the Jews. This is everyone who believes on the Lord. Romans 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no difference between Jew or Greek, no difference between Asian and European and African, South America, North America. God is no respecter of persons. Now, let's go a little further for why the law cannot render us righteous, since we know that righteousness comes through faith. In Jesus Christ. Romans 7, I'm going to read verses 1 through 13, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum up the rest of this chapter as we close this study out. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you are also uh, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Let me explain that part first. He is explaining, and we've gone over this in Bible study before, that by law, marriage is, let's say it is filed in God's spiritual filing cabinet. <coughs> Excuse me. So, marriage is not ordained by man. It's ordained by God. When I'm counseling couples, and when I also give the the inv invocation, the opening statements that we make when we do weddings. I let people know that when God brought Eve to Adam, when he presented her to Adam, the scripture says that God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. So that marriage was made legal because that marriage had God's blessing, God's direct blessing. He blessed them. But then he told them to be fruitful and multiply. So marriage is ordained of God. So what I was explaining to the class earlier was that marriage is a type and a shadow of an eternal relationship. Every relationship, everything that is established in the earth, it's temporary because heaven and earth are going to pass away. Right. All of these things are temporary. So God did not make anything temporary without an eternal message okay so marriage you are bound to your husband bound to your wife as long as you both shall live and when one dies you're free from that law well what relationship was that pointing to that is eternal that is relationship to the bride who is the church to her husband who is christ now what paul is saying is that under the law before Christ, we were bound to that law. That law is called the law of sin and death. You read that in the next chapter, Romans chapter number eight. That law that says because we are not sinless, we're going to die. So as long as we were under that law, we were bound to it until somebody died. The law wasn't going to die. 
I had to die. But if I physically died in sin, then the wages of sin is death and I'm condemned. So then what Paul is telling us is that Jesus Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death because in Christ, I become a new creature. In Christ, I'm crucified with Christ. And the scripture says that, that my flesh is crucified with Christ with the affections and lust. So the old man has died to the law. Since the old man has died, but the new man is resurrected in Christ, then I'm free to be married to somebody else. I'm no longer married to the law of sin and death. I'm married to Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Now, he tells us that being married to Christ, we should bring forth fruit unto God. Again, when God blessed Adam and Eve, made them a legally married couple, God next said, be fruitful and multiply. The whole purpose was to fill the earth, that the earth might come to know God, that the earth might feel his love. But it is a type and a shadow for us. Ha, married to Jesus Christ, we are supposed to procreate. We are supposed to produce an offspring. From our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, we produce other disciples. Notice that you do not produce physical children unless you become intimate. Unless we become intimate with Jesus, we produce no disciples. So let me put it like this. If you don't know him, you can't produce him. If, if, if you're just out there saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but you're not intimate with Jesus, how can anyone receive what you're saying? So you're trying to plant seeds with your mouth by spewing scriptures, but people see your life and they know that you're not intimate with Jesus. So there's no conception. Oh, I hope you get that. I hope you get that. Gave this example earlier that. There ain't nothing that I planted in my yard that's been fruitful. I've got a plum tree in my black my backyard that has not produced the first plum in five years. I, I, everything else I've tried to plant in my yard has died on me, and I blame the soil. But it's not just the soil. It's my lack of understanding. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I, until I get some intimate knowledge, until I grow in wisdom of gardening and farming, I will not produce, okay? I can throw seeds out there on the ground. I can put seeds in the ground. But unless I have intimate knowledge of gardening, I cannot produce from the seed that I plant. So it is with the insincere spiritual gardener who's just throwing seeds out there. This, this right here, you nobody can receive the seed. You're not going to produce any fruit because there's no relationship. You have no intimate knowledge. You have nothing within you that, that, that identifies with your marriage to Jesus Christ. So let me move on because I did a whole Bible study on that. And there's so much more to cover. And I'm trying to keep this short today. Uh, short that the, the Holy Spirit will allow me. But we are supposed to produce offering. Offspring in an intimate relationship with Christ. The more we know him, the closer we grow to him, the more we are effective at producing disciples. We are, um, I, I put it like this. Also, we're, we're like midwives, so to speak, who are witnessing believers being birthed through the womb of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, we, we're like midwives. They, they, they're being produced on our lap. We're, we're helping to deliver spiritual babies being birthed from the womb of the spirit. Yeah, that's what he gives to us. OK, so let's move on. Verse number five, Romans seven. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Hmm. But now we are delivered from the law being that being dead. Wherein we were held that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. 
For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of lust or concupiscence. Concupiscence is the same Greek word as lust. So um, uh, by taking commandment, sin, by taking commandment, wrought in me all manner of lust. For without the law, sin was dead. What he is saying is that it sounds like the law is what caused me to sin. But it's not. I was already in sin. But there was no law to uncover my sin. There was no law to condemn my sin. But when the law came, it stirred up a passion. It, it stoked the fire of my flesh. And my flesh took the occasion of the law to rebel. You know we don't like being told what to do. That's the flesh. The, 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 the flesh does not like restrictions. That's why so many people get mad when government tries to put restrictions out to help people. Because it is your flesh. And when you obey that flesh, when you follow the mindset of that flesh, quite naturally you're going to be rebellious. Because the flesh does not like law. The flesh does not like rules at all. So when the rules were introduced, it's not that the rules were bad. The rules told us what we're already doing wrong. And the flesh took that occasion to say, okay, well, you say this is wrong. I'm going to keep doing it. I've given this example time and time again, even in infants. When a baby begins to crawl around or to walk, they, for some reason, love to get near electrical outlets as though they already know that it's something bad. It's always electrical outlets. I don't care whose baby it is. And we always say, no, 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 no. And the baby understands that you're trying to keep him from going that way. And they'll look back. And they'll, they'll pause. And they'll wait till you're not looking. And go right back toward that electrical outlet. By nature, we come into this earth. Our flesh being rebellious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have to be taught to do right. Because naturally... We're going to do wrong. You know, there were laws that God had to give Moses to give to the people to not lay with beasts. People were laying with animals as they are today. When you look on the Internet, there's all types of sickness that you can just indulge yourself in. All type of sick activity because the nature of the, the flesh, there is no limit. To what this flesh will indulge in. We'll find out later that there is no good thing in this flesh. So the flesh loves to rebel against the law. Now, I wouldn't have known what lust was unless the law told me to. Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. Okay. And I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now, this is why we cannot be righteous with a legalism type religion. We cannot be righteous by law. We cannot be righteous trying to control our flesh. Because this is what Paul is saying. Before the commandment came. Before somebody told me what was wrong. I did what I wanted to do. I thought I was living it up. Then when the commandment came. I saw what sin was. And it condemned me. The law condemned me. This is why Paul says I died. I was, I found myself to be condemned because of the law. Now, that flesh continue and continue to rebel against the law. He said it deceived me and it slew me. But he concludes that the law is holy. The law is not bad. The law did not make me sin. The law showed me what sin is. But my flesh, the nature of it is to sin. 
he closes this chapter out. I'm just going to sum this up for time's sake by saying about the nature of the flesh that because I conclude that the law is good, because I agree with the law that it is good, I find myself agreeing because I know that what I do wrong is wrong. So if I can verify that what I'm doing wrong is wrong, then I agree with the law that the law is good. But Paul says I have a struggle. Man, I'm fighting. Every time I want to do good, evil is always present. He says that which I want to do good, I don't do. But that that I don't want to do, which is evil, that's the thing I find myself doing. So Paul says I find in myself in my flesh, there is no good thing. Then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? His conclusion, I thank God for Jesus. We cannot be made righteous by our flesh because our flesh naturally rebels against God's law. This is why the law does not work for righteousness. You cannot be righteous because you have to keep the whole law and the flesh hates the law. The flesh, it takes the occasion that the law is given to rebel against the law. The flesh loves to rebel against the law. You tell me to do something, I'm going to do the exact opposite thing. So, Paul says, then I, with my mind, with my whole heart, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And he begins chapter number eight. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we cannot have a works based righteousness because our flesh is rebellious. Now. Can't be righteous by the law. We find our righteousness in Jesus Christ by faith. We are more righteous than the Pharisees because we do not trust in a works-based righteousness. What then is the law that we live by? And this is what I'm closing with. Because Jesus says, if you teach people to disobey my commands, then basically I'm rejecting you. So what law do we serve? All right. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would do that men should uh, that whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them? For this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 23, 34 through 40. When the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment and the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus fulfilled everything ceremonial. Everything that was ceremonial was for atonement. Atonement completely falls on Jesus now. I can't make myself right. My faith in him is what renders me right. But there still is a law for us. The two that Jesus gives sum up the Ten Commandments. The first part of those commandments deal with our vertical relationship, our relationship with God. The latter half of that, the thou shalt not kill, steal, all of those things, that is our horizontal relationships, our relationships with one another. Jesus says you don't have to worry about memorizing those or putting them in numerical order if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and if you love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus clarifies it. A new commandment I write you, that you love one another even as I love you. 1 John 4 and 20, if a man say I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, and how can he love God whom he has not seen? If you don't love your brother that you see every day, how can you love God whom you've not seen? So then this is why loving one another is the fulfillment of the law. Because loving one another is the commandment Jesus gave to us. Then Jesus says that obeying his commandment is how you love him. So you got to love one another 
to establish the fact that you're obeying his command and that you love him. Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. I'll close it with Galatians chapter number 5. Excuse me. Verses 13 through 25, he tells us that we've been called to liberty. Don't use uh, our liberty for an occasion to uh, the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is filled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you bite and devour one another, take heed you be not consumed with one of another. But this I say then, walk in the spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Did a Bible study on this. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Same thing that he says in Romans chapter number seven. If you walk in the flesh, if you try to control the flesh by the flesh, you only do what you don't want to do. You're only going to rebel against the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus because the flesh and the spirit are contrary by nature one to another. If you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. If you're not under the law, you're free from the law and your transgression has been done away with. Works of the flesh are manifest, gives you the long list of the things that the flesh does. These that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But in verse number 22, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. There it is. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now, how do we fulfill Christ's law? You cannot do it. With a set of rules, you cannot do it with thou shalt, uh, your, your, own, your own rule books, wear this, don't wear that, do this, do that. All you're trying to do is control the flesh. And the people who are in the most legalistic religions, those are ones who end up with the biggest rebels. Because you don't understand the word that your flesh is contrary to the spirit. You cannot be made righteous following the law. We must walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. To walk in the spirit, my brothers and my sisters, is to walk in the maturity of the fruits. I don't live my life legalistic minded, trying to remind myself of this law, that law, that law, that law, this rule, that rule. What I do is I grow in the love of God. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'll understand what God's love is and how God's love in us behaves toward one another in our interpersonal relationships. If I mature in my love, then I'm not going to be self-seeking. I'm not going to be arrogant and prideful. And I'm always going to look for the needs of others before myself. If I mature in his joy, that means I find satisfaction, true satisfaction, in Jesus Christ. I'm not going out to the world. Trying to fulfill my fleshly wants. Thinking that I can be satisfied. Because by the spirit I know my flesh will never be satisfied. It will continue to rage and burn. And lust after things that I thought I never would have lusted after. So I've got to find the fulfillment. Of my joy. In Christ Jesus. If I mature in the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, he'll keep and guard my mind in Christ Jesus. There's no chaos. There's no room for me to be faithless or fearful. But I'm kept by the peace of God. Amen. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. If I'm maturing in the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. If I'm maturing in these things. I began. To walk in the spirit. I begin to display the power of the spirit in my life. He transforms me. How do I cultivate these? How do I grow in these? You grow by having your mind renewed through the word of God. We have to grow. Amen.
And we have to grow according to that seed that he put in us, that Holy Spirit, the fruit that he produces. Amen. We have to mature. So this is the law that we fulfill, loving one another, even as Christ has loved us. We do that. We have fulfilled our end of the law. Christ has fulfilled the atonement end of the law for us. And he gives us his spirit that we may fulfill our end. He gives us the power to fulfill our end of the law. Hope you got something from this. I just want to be right. How can you be right? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that we grow in his fruit and understand that we cannot trust our works-based righteousness because our flesh is contrary to the spirit, contrary to the law. The law is not done away with, but by faith, we fulfill the law. Hope to see you next week. Thank you for sitting with me um, these moments here, and we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.